Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Spokane City Council study session. Apologies for the delay. We had a little uh, technical issue here in Chambers. Um, so today we're going to have an update from Sarah Nuss on um, COVID response. And then we're going to move into a discussion about community health needs assessment and then discuss uh, citywide um, strategic planning. So we'll go right to you, Sarah. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am here to just share some of the statistics from the health district that I was not able to share last week. So these data are going to be for April 25th through May 1st, so just a few days outdated now. Uh, new cases, our rate of new cases per day is an average of 105. Uh, when it comes to our age groups, uh, lots of discussion around the fact that currently right now 24% of the new cases are being carried by the age group of 20 to 29. Another 19% are being carried from the age group of 10 to 19. So, you know, a lot of the message from the health district was uh, from Dr. Velasquez to, you know, how can we work to get this age group um, vaccinated? How can we work to make it more attractive? What can we do to make it uh, more convenient? Uh, lots of work going on in that arena. Uh, cases by race, I'm just going to read them all out. American Indian and Alaskan Native is 3%. Asian, 1%. Black, 3%. Hispanic, 2%. Uh, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander is 1%. Other or unknown, as in non-reported, would be 25%. And then white or Caucasian is 65%. Our rate uh, of new cases per 100,000 people for the last two weeks is 280. Uh, we had four new deaths last week, one individual between age 10 and 19, one in their 60s, one in their 70s, and one in their 80s. And there were 70 deaths last, or sorry, seven deaths last week. Um, as far as testing goes, the average number of tests daily is individuals tested daily is 901. Percent positivity is 10.1. That's down from last week. Uh, when it comes to vaccination data in our community here in Spokane uh, County, the percent of the eligible population that has been vaccinated, so that means everyone age 16 and above, uh, is 31.88%. So we're doing great there. It's nearly a third of the population. Our isolation facilities are doing well, both at 15 and 17% capacity, so lots of room until we shut that down. And that is the end of my report for today. All right. Um, but I guess before I let you leave, do we have any update on reopening um, the first floor and third floor counters in City Hall? What's the plan on that? So we, our work group met yesterday and uh, the plan for now is to hold until we know what the governor will be saying in two weeks since we are currently holding at phase three. We just want to stay consistent along with that messaging and with what other businesses are doing. However, we are working with some of the third floor and first floor um, services to try and get some appointments going on so that we can continue, continue increasing our uh, opportunity to provide those services in person, but still maintaining our current status quo of City Hall being closed to the public. So we'll be releasing some guidance on that and what the plan is moving forward here in about two weeks in line with the governor's uh, declaration. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Sarah? All right. Not seeing any. Again, thanks always. We really appreciate your coming to see us on Thursdays. And uh, we'll see you next week. Um, all right. Next up is community health needs assessment. Um, I have it down as Melissa Morrison, but I'm assuming, Melissa, that you're going to be turning it over to some of our visitors. So uh, take it away. Yes, thank you. And good afternoon, Council. Um, I have been working and um, some other Council staff with Councilmember Wilkerson in the participating in the National League of Cities, Cities of Opportunity, Community of Practice around Cities and Health Systems. Um, this study session was requested by Councilmember Wilkerson to share some of the information that we've learned um, with Council on strategies for city leaders to partner with health systems to address complex issues surrounding root causes of health inequity. The Cities of Opportunities um, Community of Practice is working to ensure robust city and health system partnership to improve health outcomes and advance um, the and advance the, the health of, of our cities. Um, right now, the cities in the community of practice are Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Bloomington, Illinois, Charlotte, North Carolina, Dallas, Texas, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Huntington, West Virginia, um, Lawrence, 
Massachusetts, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Roanoke, Virginia, and us. Um, the two cities that we have been most closely working with in our, in our smaller cohorts have been Dallas and Charlotte. And so we have three presenters today. Um, just to give you kind of a quick overview of the, the three folks presenting is first, Kevin Barnett. Um, he's from the Public Health Institute to give a big picture focus of why are we looking at this and the partnership and collaboration um, between systems nationwide. And he has been doing this around the country, um, so can also give some ideas of how other cities have implemented um, some of these strategies. Sarah Clement Sampson from um, Providence on what the community benefit process is, um, the past assessments for the Spokane region, an update on the next community health needs assessment. And then Helene Dewey um, from the Spokane Regional Health Department um, to talk more about specifically health ex equity in Spokane and looking at the upstream model. So, um, they're going to each be giving about a 15-minute presentation, um, but feel free to ask questions. Um, we've built in some time for discussion, but we're really hoping this will be a fruitful conversation for council to kind of learn what we've been doing. Um, and so if Council Member Wilkerson wants to add anything, since she's been a very helpful participant in this process. I just want, I just want to welcome everyone, uh, our speakers today. And as we've been looking at issues in our city, I have always been challenged with why are we not partnering more with the other folks, especially our healthcare entities. And they are doing the assessments as we are trying to assess our city and the role we could play and how we can partner to leverage this work for the best outcome. So I'm looking forward to what's going to be presented today and thank you all again for being here. So first we're gonna hear from Kevin Barnett. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Council Member Wilkerson. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you folks thus far. I am the director of the Center to Advance Community Health and Equity at the Public Health Institute. I've spent much of the last 30 years working with hospitals, health systems, cities, counties, a variety of government agencies and community groups with a focus on a more strategic approach to how do we address not just the symptoms, but the under underlying drivers of poor health in our communities. Um, I, uh, a quick question to Melissa, would you like me to bring up uh, the PowerPoint on my end so I can advance the slides? Yep, that's great if you want to want to do it on your end. Great. So uh, I'm going to do my best to stay closer to 10 than to 15 minutes because I really welcome the opportunity to engage uh, folks um, in conversation. But what I want to try to do is to provide a, a big picture of uh, big picture perspective on this work. So bear with me here as I get right. And now the slide. Okay. So, um, so this, this effort and our partnership with the National League of Cities is, uh, involves working directly with teams of city staff and leaders to look at ways in which they can engage hospitals. Obviously, our historical view of hospitals is uh, providers of acute care medical services. Uh, increasingly, and as I'll make the point in, in the course of this presentation, um, they are at a juncture, um, an important juncture in their history and looking at the degree to which they remain acute care medical centers and the degree to which they expand, take on an expanding role um, in improving health in our communities. So this is, um, this is to look at these, these issues. And I'd, I'd be remiss, particularly given the update we just received, if I didn't acknowledge where we are in the context of, of the COVID pandemic, as well as the uh, growing awareness in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and its growth. This, this pandemic has certainly uh, impacted us in terms of insurance coverage. We're back we're back up to 31 million without coverage. We still have 12 states that haven't implemented the Medicaid expansion. And many of our markets are still predominantly fee for service, but we recognizing, recognize we're moving towards risk-based reimbursement. Just a few uh, points about what's happened during COVID. We've had, we've had at least 10 years of what was projected at movement towards telehealth in a matter of months as part of this pandemic. This is really opening some new doors in ways in which we expand access, assuming we give provide access to, to ban, uh, broadband. We have between 20 and 40 million residents 
in our communities across the country that still lack uh, access to broadband. But we've also seen fairly significant drops in outpatient visits for key chronic illnesses that, um, that need to be effectively managed. Perhaps uh, most significantly, as I talk to healthcare leaders across the country, is the recognition, A, that we have profound inequities in our communities, social and economic, that are major drivers of our health inequities, and that we have to begin to take this issue on in a more fundamental way. And secondarily, um, we have profoundly underinvested in our public health infrastructure. So how do we begin to link arms to address these issues in a more effective way? This, this, um, this slide can, captures where we are and where we're moving towards in the healthcare arena. The vertical axis really lays out the, the alphabet soup of different uh, changes that we're making in the payment models, gradually moving increasingly towards risk-based reimbursement, which in, in layman's terms means that hospitals health plans and others will make more money if we can keep people healthy and out of our acute care facilities. On the horizontal axis, uh, part of providing the engine for moving in this direction is that we are getting better and better at, at doing analyses. Um, looking at um, patients with common conditions, then beginning to look at the factors that impact the panels, and then beginning to see that there are geographic patterns that these, that these kinds of issues are emerge in particular neighborhoods. And so how do we work with a variety of stakeholders to address these issues? That's, that is clearly what is in the minds of all but those healthcare leaders that have their heads in the sand. Everybody I talk to um, indicates that we've got to prepare for this. This is a part of competitive advantage. It's how we build the capacity to address these issues. The, the stumbling block, of course, are the broad array of factors that are all well outside of what we have traditionally done in the healthcare arena, all of which have a dramatic impact upon our health and well being in our populations. One area we're growing greater sensitivity to is this concept of toxic stress, or, or in, in clinical terms, allostatic load. We know that the kind of stress that you and I experience is, doesn't compare to the kind of stress that people the day to day are wondering how they're going to pay rent. Are utilities going to cut off? Is the car going to start this morning? I just got called into my second job and who's picking up the kids from school? These are the kinds of day to day challenges that we now know have a direct impact upon glucose tolerance, upon cardiovascular function, um, and contribute to, to much poorer health among populations at the lower end of the economic strata. We also know that um, um, the, the, the pandemic that we experienced before the current one was diabetes and is diabetes. And, and it, for the first time in modern history, we are seeing life expectancy going down um, in our country because of the large and growing number of people with diabetes. What we also know about diabetes is that there are an array of factors, just as I described, that are real drivers of this. Um, and we need to, to think more comprehensively as we address these issues. The good news is that we are beginning to come together. Um, if you look at the domains of activity listed across the top, in the healthcare arena, of course, the lion's share of focus has been on clinical care and clinical drivers. What we're now understanding is that behavior, social determinants, and physical environment are all have, all have an impact as well. And we're doing this just as our colleagues in the chambers and planning agencies, uh, in community development, financial institutions, and our municipalities are recognizing that we need to look beyond the physical environment to look at how it impacts people's behavior and, and the way in which they engage socially. We can't talk about this issue without acknowledging that um, many people in our communities are starting from a standpoint in the cha historical challenge that began in the 30s where the federal government began creating um, basically the red line communities that forced um, predominantly African Americans fleeing Jim Crow policies in the South into much smaller proportions of our cities. At the same time, we removed access to, uh, to traditional mortgages. We saw capital flight. We've, we've seen a process while 
redlining has ended technically, we know um, uh, that there are still pre uh, prejudicial practices among lenders. And we know that we've created a dynamic where we have multi-generational poverty. The same parts of our cities that were redlined now 70, 80 years ago are still the poorest parts of our cities. So how do we begin to begin to reverse this historical dynamic? How do we come to terms with, with the practical realities facing the people that live in these particular neighborhoods? So as it relates to hospitals, particularly nonprofit hospitals and their community benefit obligations, it's important to know that property tax exemption collected on behalf of cities is represents the largest component of their tax exemption. Um, we also know that some of the first class actions against nonprofit hospitals came in the Northeastern United States as we began to see white flight, um, uh, Caucasian populations leaving the city and moving to suburbs, these areas being emptied out and um, low income community members, the only ones retaining. And we began to see patterns of service among nonprofit hospitals of serving those those suburban, uh, suburb, suburb populations while not providing sufficient services to those in the low income urban areas. And cities began to question whether or not hospitals were returning the value of their property tax exemption. Um, <clears throat> so we saw a range of these kinds of city class actions, particularly in the 70s. This has evolved to uh, an array of state statutes in the 80s and 90s and beyond. And, and what really brought this into focus for the, uh, for the Senate at the federal level was a report on a practice at Yale New Haven uh, Medical Center in, in early 2000s. They were given a $20 million contribution by a wealthy donor. Uh, they put that money into the stock market while that money was intended explicitly to pay for charity care for those who qualified for charity care. And it was learned that they were going aggressively after these low income populations while investing this money in the stock market. This call caused our, our uh, Senate, the Senate Finance Committee under Senator Grassley in particular, to begin to ask what, in fact, what is the difference between nonprofits and for profits? So um, all of this continues to be of interest. Um, and here's a, a story that just came out in January where uh, again, Yale New Haven is looking at an, an expansion. Residents who live in their nearby neighborhoods are worried about them being displaced to make room for, for this new facility. Uh, even more recently, just this last month, a uh, study came out in Health Affairs that questions uh, whether or not hospitals are providing enough charity care. I have an array of questions. In fact, I'm working on a response article to this because they focus simply on charity care and overlook the broad array of other kinds of contributions, in fact, that we are and should be encouraging hospitals to make, again, working with cities and others. So all of this is the work of our Center to Advance Community Health and Equity. We look at ways in which to use um, both the report, the data that hospitals report on the 990 Schedule H. Uh, we do GIS analysis of social determinants, look at community health needs assessments and implementation strategies, and look at overlays as it relates to public health communities assessments and, and implementation plans, as well as a variety of other sources of data uh, to, to help inform these efforts. Um, uh, this is an example of a GIS map that we used as part of a study we did for the CDC a few years ago using what's called the Vulnerable Populations Footprint Tool. In this map highlights how two, two different nonprofit health systems define their service area for low-income populations. One hospital, one group of hospitals define their community in a way the black outlined area looks like it specifically works around those tan census tracts, which are the census tracts where poverty was concentrated in the in those communities. So it's just to highlight that there are an array of increasingly sophisticated tools that will bring growing transparency to not only what kinds of behaviors do we want to encourage, but how can we better allocate our resources? These are the categories that nonprofit hospitals report in and in their, in their 990. This is a, uh, an excerpt from some work that we did in, Los, in a section of Los Angeles 
um, uh, service plan in areas three and four. You see there's some big numbers here, um, but by far the biggest expenditures is in terms, is in the form of Medicaid shortfalls over a half a billion dollars for a group of about 20 hospitals in part of LA. Point this out because a significant proportion of those expenditures for Medicaid shortfalls are for treatment of, of preventable conditions. In essence, if those individuals had timely access to primary care and preventive services, they would not have ended up in the emergency rooms of these hospitals. Um, this is, uh, these are a set of diagnoses that are, uh, were developed and sanctioned by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality of the federal government. And these are specific diagnoses, specific ICD-10 codes that one can look at and geocode for any community that will enable you to see where these concentrations are. This is a map we developed for the same area. And what you'll see are the areas that are outlined in light to dark blue are areas where the rates of this particular PQI of diabetes short-term complications are as much as five times as high as the county average for this. So this is a way of pointing us to what specific sub-geographic areas, uh, where there are, are uh, health inequities concentrated, and where we can better target our interventions uh, to reduce the demand for treatment of preventable conditions in our emergency rooms. These are the kinds of analyses we're doing in a number of the communities that are part of the National League of Cities efforts, as well as partnerships we have in other states. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move towards the end by just focusing specifically in a new and growing area for hospitals uh, uh, to leverage their assets, and that is in the form of healthcare investment. And um, so what we have in that arena uh, in, in this area are these are examples of ways in which hospitals are leveraging a portion of their investment portfolio sometimes also providing grants, direct contributions, sometimes making land available um, at a, at, for donation or lease to help support a variety of different forms of the local economic development in these communities. Um, and doing so in a way that really helps um, achieve the kinds of goals increasingly that municipalities are establishing for themselves. Again, I'm gonna move quickly on this um, because I know this will probably be an important point of discussion. I want to note this is this was discussed uh, most recently in an article that just came out in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. The whole concept of establishing neighborhood trusts, where you create an opportunity first to avoid displacement of low-income populations, um, but but even more importantly, to give them an opportunity to buy into uh, an opportunity to get returns on investment themselves. This idea of creating this trust, where you uh, create a, a mechanism to pool small level investments. Let's, they could be 10 to 50 to $100 each where, where low income residents can buy shares in property that's acquired uh, and can be subsequently developed for significant returns to those individuals. You'll see there are examples in play in Cleveland, Minneapolis, Memphis, and Kansas City. So it's, it's definitely worth exploring. Um, uh, ProMedica is maybe the highest profile example is the regional system in Northern Ohio and Southern Michigan. They located their corporate headquarters in a part of the inner city in Toledo and really looking at ways in which to uh, leverage their investment portfolio, including the purchase of a grocery store, uh, establishment of a new grocery store, this training center, uh, working with one of our largest community development financial institutions in the, in the country list to do this. They've also established a national organization called the Root Cause Coalition that brings together hospitals and health systems around moving this agenda. This is a smaller scale uh, example, but one that's become increasingly uh, of importance to hospitals as we look at the growing number of homeless people in our communities. This was an outgrowth of a convening we had at the Boston Fed about four years ago, uh, brought together teams, hospital leaders and community development groups, in this case, University of Vermont Health Network, um, after this session came together with a local community development corporation, acquired an old motel and converted it into 
uh, basically to apartments for people that were otherwise homeless um, and have provide them with a wrap, an array of wraparound services, training, counseling, and channeling them to ultimately affordable housing as it became available. Uh, UVHN uh, documented about a savings of about a million dollars a year just in the first two years from, from the development of this. Um, so all of this is around is the growing area of medical respite. How do we stop the cycle of homeless people in and out of our emergency rooms and provide them with a path for greater stability and support? Um, and at the same time, there's a clear return on investment for all involved. Last couple slides I just want to leave you with is the way in which we're beginning to increasingly think broadly about what hospitals and health systems can contribute. They can use their uh, leverage around procurement, uh, both to, uh, to support local businesses and in many ways to provide, to build local capacity to help start minority firms and help, help them on their ways. To invest in healthcare pathways for, for young people who are underrepresented, including youth that may be justice involved. Um, looking at ways in which, which they can reduce their carbon footprint. Be in the realm of advocacy and engaging local, uh, local policymakers in how to address these broader issues that are beginning to impact healthcare in a negative way. Um, I've talked about the issue of investment and um, a lot of the work we're engaged in in Spokane and others is how can we be more specific and focused in specific low-income neighborhoods of Spokane. The last slide is just to highlight as I've engaged and continue to engage board members and hospital leaders around the country on this issue is, is making the case that they need to have members of their C-suite, of their senior leadership team, not just their lobbyists, not just their public affairs officer, but senior leadership engaged in understanding what's in the comprehensive plan of the city in which they, they're involved. Do they serve on the United Way board? Are they engaged with the chambers of commerce? How are we thinking about ways in which to leverage the assets of our healthcare stakeholders? So um, I'm gonna stop there um, and I just wanted to tee up a frame for how we are engaged uh, with the council member and your, your colleagues in looking at how to move this agenda. Thank you. All right, I saw uh, council member Cathcart I saw it has a hand. I'm not going to necessarily see everyone's hand, so feel free to just volunteer after he asks his question. Yeah, two, two questions for you. One is uh, if, if we, I guess, uh, push for or require hospitals to, to do a lot of these things, uh, you know, does that not create added costs on them that's going to end up getting passed on in the form of, of what they charge for medical care? And then also um, yeah. in terms of, of citing um, some of these housing uh for, for uh, those experiencing homelessness around the hospitals, does that not encourage them to be utilizing the hospital for medical care, which is the most expensive you know, place to get that care? So um, let me address your first question. First of all, I'm, I'm not suggesting uh, requiring or browbeating hospitals. The good news is increasingly there's voluntary leadership among hospitals to look at ways in which to work together to address these issues. Um, and doing so, um, as it relates to the Medicaid shortfalls I, I outlined earlier, this is an area, clear area for collaboration, both across sectors and across competitive lines. Hospitals that may be otherwise competing for commercially insured populations should be willing to look at ways in which to reduce the demand for treatment of preventable conditions in the Medicaid population. Those are the contracts that are increasingly in the form of risk-based reimbursement. So there's a clear financial incentive to reduce the volume of those kinds of visits going forward. So, um, so all this is about looking at where we are in the trajectory of moving towards, uh, moving from volume-based reimbursement, basically fee-for-service, to various forms of risk-based reimbursement, and how do we work with hospitals to address the drivers of poor health? How do we work with them to reduce the demand for treatment in their emergency rooms. Now, um, addressing your second question, the way in which um, utilization occurs, particularly in the emergency rooms, is um, hospitals that tend to be located, obviously more proximal to low-income communities, tend to have a much larger number of those individuals coming into their emergency room. 
and they come into their emergency room because that's that they know that the hospitals are required to provide those services. And of course, they don't have um, a primary care physician or some other form of care that could address their issues in a more pro proactive way. Um, um, I think if you're addressing the issue of whether or not a hospital might donate adjoining land for affordable housing, uh, is that is that the crux of your question? Well, we, we just hear all the time of just how expensive it is to, to serve folks in the emergency room. And usually there's much cheaper options with offsite clinics and things like that. And if you're going to mix it, it, just my thinking out loud here, but if you're going to mix uh, medical facilities and housing, it seems like you'd want to make sure that it's it's going to be the most cost effective, you know, form of medical treatment. And, and if emergency rooms are so expensive, then wouldn't you want to cite the, the housing, you know, around offsite clinics and not the hospital per se. Yeah, and I think in most cases, the uh, additional land that hospitals might have is not right next to the emergency room. Um, it's, it's in other areas. But, I, uh, but the point being, uh, yes, what we want to do is to expand access to, to primary care and preventive services for people. And, and that mostly does not occur, although a growing number of hospitals are establishing urgent care centers so they can at least channel people out of the emergency room and, and into those centers. But we're still, we are still struggling. I, I was just had a conversation with the CEO of one of our larger uh, Medicaid uh, managed care plans in Central California a couple of weeks ago. And I asked him if he knew how many of his approximately 400,000 enrollees um, were homeless. And he said, you know, I don't. And moreover, we only have meaningful data for about 20% of our Medicaid enrollees. And, and part of that is because we haven't, uh, our orientation is, is how to provide acute care and not ways in which to reach out and meet people where they are to provide the kind of care through teams of community health workers and through addressing some of these drivers of poor health. So my preference would always be how do we, let's start with looking at most of the care that we provide in the emergency room as being uh, forms of care and high expenditures that we can and should avoid by providing earlier earlier access to the full spectrum of services. But we have a, lo a long way to go. We've, we've built this grand edifice that is focused on downstream medical care instead of investing on creating the conditions under which people can be healthy. Council President, I have a question. Yes, Councilmember Kinnear. Uh, this was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Some of the things that you presented, we are already doing. Some of the things are, are issues and solutions that we've looked at. I was especially interested in the, the rehab of an old, old motel because I've been talking about that for two years. And people are just nodding at me going, yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds great, but nothing's really happened. Mm -hmm. And um, at this, this slide right here, under food policy councils, we established a food policy council four or five years ago um, at the city level, and it broke off from the city, and it's now its own thing, so we don't have mm -hmm. a lot of communication Mm -hmm. We have a we have a community garden program. So there are all these things we're doing, but they're not really coordinated towards a common goal or a common end product that I see you're presenting here. So thank you for tying it all together. Is there a way that you could send us a copy of this presentation, or is it for Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Great. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And you'll have it in a way you can you can mix and match and use slides however you want. I'm interested in looking at how we can move the field, so. This is great, thank you. You bet. Council President, this is Karen, I have a question. Yes, Council Member Stratton. So one of the things that I've been thinking about for a very long time, and this fits right into it, except where, except my mind goes to bringing in higher education. In a community like Spokane's, I just like where we live, and we have University of Washington Dental, we have WSU Medical, we have these universities, we have community colleges training, that at some point it would be 
um, and I don't know if it's happened, but, but a reach out to the higher ed community to sit down in these discussions to partner on some of these programs. Um, if it's training students or students that have to do practicums or students that um, need certain credits to, to graduate, it would seem to me that that would be a natural fit. And also on the data side, if you had um, faculty that could really dig deep into the poverty and homelessness, um, deep root causes of that. So I agree, this is a great presentation, but my mind went right to the group in my mind that's missing is how do we draw in higher ed to build this up a little bit? Because I think there's a lot of resources there that, that we just haven't, haven't touched yet. Council member, I'm so glad that you said that and you, you tapped into another deep passion of mine. I, I had the great privilege uh, of serving as a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that produced the report in 2004 on increasing diversity in the health professions. And an important question, the reason I was asked because of the community benefit research that I was doing at the time was the basic question, can and should we expect health professions, education institutions to do more than wring their hands and say the pool of diverse qualified applicants um, isn't big enough. Um, shouldn't they be reaching out and engaging and providing opportunities and investing in the next generation of youth in our low income communities so they have the opportunity to get that education. Now, we need to start early on on that, certainly the discussion in the current administration about investing in early childhood education is critical. We have it in California, we've had a, the first five commission in place now for over a decade and we still have over 30% of our population and obviously it's the low income 30% that don't have access to early childhood education. And so they start out behind the curve at the very beginning and almost never catch up. So, so it's, so that's important, and I and I would I'd go to the other piece that you mentioned, uh, which is as we one of the most important ways that we engage hospitals and health systems is to say, hey, we know this is not this is not just your job. These problems are deep, they're historical, and they're complex, and it requires us all to link arms. And I would say, just as we can and should expect that our nonprofit hospitals, and particularly our larger health systems to invest a portion of their investment portfolio. Providence is, has staked this area out. They provide a great leadership in this arena as well. We need to bring others into this, including our universities, because they also have significant investment portfolios that they can leverage. We're having these conversations um, uh, going in this direction in a number of other years, but it's an important way to ensure that the hospital see this isn't just about getting into their pockets. Any other council questions? So I just uh, wanted to note several years ago in Cleveland, uh, the hospitals and the universities banded together to support worker-owned cooperatives more as an economic development. But I think the lesson yep. I'm hearing from you is that that's good, but what you're saying is because we're moving away from fee-for-service to simply uh, per capita payments, it's actually cheaper for hospitals to invest in housing now and cheaper to invest in uh, economic development in low-income communities because it's just going to cost them less because they have to pay for – they have to provide the service for whatever the health needs are, and they're not getting any more money necessarily. So it's really pu yeah. pulling all of that together, and I'm just wondering if you wanted to make a comment about the Evergreen Cooperatives in, in Cleveland. It, uh, Spokane seems like a much smaller version of Cleveland, but very similar uh, feeling and grit wise. So, yeah, I think I think the work the Cleveland Clinic and oh, I'm sorry, was somebody you were asking somebody else? Okay, no, no, I was uh, talking to you. Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, I think what Cleveland Clinic and uh, University Health System did is is notable. Um, my question was. At the same time, they were investing in local economic development. They were building a billion-dollar steel and glass tower mm -hmm. uh, that I'm not sure they're going to need in, in the long run. Part mm -hmm. of 
part of the dynamic in healthcare is we, we really do have to question uh, our model and approach to development um, historically. And they may be already regretting their investment in that large facility. I know many other hospitals that are now looking at these large facilities and wondering uh, how they should be making their investment. But I, I do think that, you know, they contributed an early stage of thinking more along the lines of this anchor institution approach. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is where we want to go. I do want to emphasize, though, that as we talk about hospitals getting involved in investment, it's important to meet them where they are. And that's why I gave emphasis to this issue of preventable ED and inpatient utilization. Um, that that it, We need to help understand and build an, uh, the return on investment case at the institutional level, and then particularly in the context of municipalities, what's the broader social return on investment? What are ways in which we reduce the demand on law enforcement, on, on, uh, on uh, social services, on array of the demands that we, we're grappling with at this juncture through more proactive and strategic investment? Yeah. All right. Great. So I've lost track of who the next speaker is, um, but someone can remind me. So whoever you are, um, introduce yourself. <laughs> it's Sarah Clement Sampson from Providence. Yeah. All right. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Hello. And I think I, I know many of you. I'm the Community Health Investment Manager for Providence Healthcare in Eastern Washington and Montana, focused largely on Spokane and Stevens County. And let me see if I can share my screen. Are you all seeing that? Oops. Are you seeing that all right? Um, so far, it's loading, but we just have a gray square on, on black. Okay. Oh, now it, I see it now. I see your title okay. page. So, uh, so, yes, that's me. That's who we are. <laughs> I think a lot of you know. Um, we primarily see the um, uh, in Spokane, it's uh, Sacred Heart, Holy Family. And then I will touch on. Mount Carmel and St. Joseph's up in Stevens County, and I'll give you a little bit of that in a minute. These were the questions I was asked to touch on, so I hope I fulfill that um, as much as I can. Um, as uh, I believe it's Kevin, wasn't that right? Was saying, you know, this we view um, community benefit really as this intersection between our government entities and the community, as well as ourselves. Community benefits are the programs and services designed to improve health in communities and increase access to health care. They are miserable contributions made by nonprofit hospitals to improve the overall health and well-being of our local communities. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was passed in 2010, made community benefit uh, requirements into law. But before that, that was largely these were largely best practices. Providence, we view these as essential to our mission. Our sisters went out and did this. They went out to assess the needs in the community and then figure out how to address them. And that's largely how we view this to this day. And we continue and we continue to support it. The good of it being made into law is that it helps standardize what is considered community benefit. Um, you know, both for local, state, federal government agencies all want to know whether, you know, to get down to the bare meat of it, whether we deserve our tax benefit status. So this really helps us tell our story in a standardized way. It also helps us report internally and then to external, all external stakeholders. We utilize the Catholic Health Association as our baseline, uh, as our, our guidelines. They have worked with the IRS for a number of years to solidify what, what should count, what shouldn't count, what are these definitions, what is this work? And as Kevin said, I just wanna give um, kind of an update. This is our 2020 numbers. And as he mentioned, a large portion of it is this Medicaid shortfall. I do wanna emphasize that these are costs not charges. So these are the costs to us, not necessarily, um, as Council Member Kaspar said, you know, those large, large charges that we see within the community that we have to kind of make up our bottom line. What we report out are our costs. So it is um, so our shortfall for, and the, so with considering PHC is the two counties, it is Spokane and Stevens County, large percentage of that is Sacred Heart, um, but we do include um, also, St. Luke's um, Rehabilitation Institute as well into these numbers. 
So our charity care, just so that you are aware, aware as, as well, so all people are eligible for us to write off some of their bill up to 350% of the federal poverty level. We tend to do a, stair, um, a sliding scale fee up until 200% of federal poverty level. So if your income matches that, you know, we work with you to either sign you up with Medicaid or um, we will work on um, uh, forgiving that. And that's what we count as our um, charity care. Our subsidized services, I'll get into these in a little bit, but they really aren't, they aren't for market share. They aren't to bring people into our doors. These are services that we provide at a loss when we take out charity care, when we take out Medicaid shortfall, when we take out bad debt, but we feel they are integral to our community. If we didn't provide them, our community would suffer. And as was mentioned, education and research. Um, we are identified as a federally recognized health, profinish, health professional shortage area in primary care mental health, and dental. And so any of those areas that we can help get more people into those fields would be a bonus to us. And so there is a cost to us. There is a cost in terms of we pay some of our residency salaries, you know, and that isn't necessarily, you know, these people are learning. And we want to encourage them to learn. We want them to encourage to stay here. We want to encourage them to come to our rural communities up in Stevens County and areas like that. Um, and we, we need more. And so how can we create more of these pathways exactly? I think it was uh, Council Member um, Kinnear or Stratton was talking about um, you know, our education and how can we bridge those gaps. And those are things that we, we want to look at. And then our community programs and services. And this is where we have our $3 million in donations that we give out to the community each year, along with um, education that we provide to the community, any staff time that we are saying this is important for us and we will take on that cost so that they can be out in the community providing all of that. I wanna to touch on these, these are some of our subsidized services as was mentioned um, by Council Member Cathcart, uh, kind of that, that housing situation. That's one reason that we moved the House of Charity Clinic outside of the House of Charity so that we can partner better with the housing um, units that Catholic Charities is putting up, be more external so that someone isn't re really connected to um, a, to a shelter to be able to get our care. Um, and this is really in place. So those that are denied care at CHAZ, we will not deny their care. They come to us at, at any place, but we do, we don't make money off of that. Um, same with our pediatric oncology. If we didn't provide that, you would either have to go to Minneapolis or Seattle. There is no other pediatric oncology place it's, uh, anywhere near here. And that's one reason that we include physical therapy up in Stevens County, because those are the only physical therapy um, that's only access to low-income people have the physical therapy if they want any kind of care. The only other ones are you have to have private insurance, and so these will take Medicaid and charity care. And then, as was mentioned, our the Providence Dental Residency Clinic, and that was based off of our needs assessment that we um, pulled of our homeless population and the need for that. And so we have that dental residency, plus we have the clinics. I know there's one at Sacred Heart where I think we're still working on opening the one up at Holy Family, but that'll hope, uh, I think it is, it's in connection with Chaz, I believe. Um, and, you know, opening up more of those beds and being able to get more upstream. And then one that we're looking at um, uh, subsidizing this year is the maxillofacial cleft lip palate program that was out, um, housed at the health district. Um, it has been independent and operated by some volunteers for, um, for a number of years now. And we're looking at bringing that internal. And again, for that same reason with the pediatric oncology is if we don't provide it, then you have to go to Seattle as the closest one. And as was mentioned, we have um, an obligation to do a community needs assessment every three years and a community health improvement plan. We are in the midst of that needs assessment right now. Um, and I'll let Steve talk about that in a second because we are partnering with the health district. Um, but this is really, we have some, some requirements within the 990 of who are we reaching out to? How are we partnering with the community? How are we really getting the community voice? Um, and, you know, really identifying and having the community prioritize what are those needs. And that's where we've really seen that shift into social determinants of health. Community isn't necessarily going to put diabetes up, but they're going to put poverty. They're going to put food shortage up as a top need that they're dealing with. And the community health improvement plan is our way of interpreting that. And so when the community says housing, what does that mean for Providence? And we have that opportunity to say, well, what is it that we are going to get into? Are we really going to get into building and managing housing? 
or are we going to support some of those agencies that are doing that work and how can we better support them? Um, you know, some of those things may come up as, <laughs> this isn't the case, but I just want to kind of paint the picture. It may come up as mental health and we might say, well, there's a behavioral health hospital. Let the, them be the experts and do that. We want to, we, we recognize mental health is a huge issue. And so that is one that we are taking on. Um, but we have that kind of ability to be able to say, this isn't in our area versus what is in our area and how are we going to address that? And so I, I really view these two as a needs assessment is taking the voice of the community and then it's the external piece of it. And the community health improvement plan is really the internal, how are we going to do this? How are we going to um, uh, address these issues in, and hopefully in partnership with the community? And then we are in the midst of our community, um, our community health needs assessment right now um, with, in, like I mentioned, in partnership with uh, the health district. So I'll let Steve kind of have some say at that. What do you want to, what do you want to say about it? <laughs> well, thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, we are um, really excited to partner with Providence and this year MultiCare and Empire Health Foundation to complete the 2021 community health needs assessment. So we have just kicked this off um, in the past month or so. Um, we are currently in the midst of collecting and analyzing data, um, including, uh, I'll, I'll go over the indicators here in a little bit, but our intent is to pull both those population level health indicators that we can, as well as look at voice of the community type level data, um, including our quality of life survey that went out in 2020. We're in the midst of a LGBTQ plus um, community health survey as well as some other just um, reviews of behavioral health and um, COVID data as well. Um, once we complete that part and kind of in tandem, we are going to go into focus groups with a large uh, broad swath of members of the community and community groups, um, which we're also hoping to propose to you all as a potential to contribute to one of those, um, as well as individual key informant interviews. The intent of the uh, CHNA is to be done um, by July so it's a pretty rapid timeline, but we are excited to get going. Um, just a little more information on what we are reviewing as far as data. So we kind of have it in these large groups. Uh, the first would be descriptions of the community. So that is both your demographics, as well as so, some of the social determinants of health, you know, housing, poverty, food security, education, income. Um, we will look at leading causes of death, levels of chronic illness, access to healthcare and use of preventative services, mental health and substance use, maternal and child health, physical activity, nutrition, weight, violence and injury prevention, um, as well as, again, the quality of life, the LGBTQ plus survey, and other um, pieces of information that we have done primary data collection from for the community. So that's my brief on that, but we are excited to get going here. And then, so, so what we are currently working off of is our 2018 assessment. And so those were identified as decreased family violence and trauma, increased access to mental health services and uh, mental health and substance abuse treatment, and increased access to affordable housing. And I also want to bring up Stevens County because as one of the data points that we look at is what is our discharge percentage? And actually one of the top discharge like zip code percentage is um, 99114, which is uh, um, I believe. And so we are affected by these, these communities that are, that surround us. And we recognize that. So there's up there is support for youth and families, continuing care for the aging population and access to care. And some of the accomplishments around each of these, these are just a few we've done. We have numerous um, efforts under each of these needs, uh, but these are just a few. And so as a result for the YWCA, we have a we partnership with them where we're working on kind of addressing the domestic violence issues that we see in the hospital right away. And as a result of the contact with the hospital and court-based advocacy project, 80% or more of the identified domestic violence victims created strategies for enhancing their safety. We partnered with the health district and with Women Helping Women Fund to get that report out. And we really um, like data and the reports going out because then, like, like I was mentioned, we can all be working on the same information and be citing the same source and hopefully start gearing ourselves and driving in the same direction as many of these agencies look at this information. We recognize that, um, you know, child abuse rates, we are the children's hospital. They are going to come to us at the worst. And so how can we domestic violence, all those sort of things, how can we get more upstream so that we don't even see them? Because ultimately, 
that would be the best is because we don't want to see those. That's it's, it's the worst. It's heart wrenching. It's horrible. So how can we partner with others to get those services, those foundations in place so they don't even need to come to the hospital? Um, in terms of mental health and substance abuse, we have a lot of internal efforts just around um, a better transition of care. How can we outreach? How can we do some of these things? But these are a few of our specific efforts external. And so we have one of the, we've pulled our data because we, um, we contribute to the information around um, uh, the suicide rate. And so the information that we are able to contribute is um, what's considered self-harm. So we pulled our data and the top zip code to come to one of our hospitals and have self-harm within their medical record was the 99208 zip code. So looking at kind of the swath of everything, and this is youth, you know, we were really focusing on youth. We partnered with the Mead School District, with Mead High School, and helped them prevent, and along with EWU uh, sociology staff, or school social work staff, to really train up their, st their teachers and staff in the mental health first aid program, create a stepped up model before they get to the threat assessment, which is when, they, when a student actually makes a claim of harm to self or others. And you know everyone comes in at that time, but how can we identify those pieces earlier and get some of those kids earlier, regardless of their ability to pay? Because as many of you may know, the, uh, the counselors that are within the schools really can only address Medicaid. They have a cap of about 30, that they, caseload of about 30 that they can handle. So this was really the, how can we get some of these teachers talking that know these students, and then also give the this, this teachers and staff resources. We have resources in town, but as we were doing some of our listening sessions, they didn't know how to access those resources. And so how can we better streamline that and bridge that within our community? Many of you know about um, the, the Frontier Behavioral Health um, behavioral response unit that the police um, provide, and I believe they get that through True Blood Fund, we provide funding for the fire department. And so no matter who's getting called by 911, whoever's getting, goes out first, whether it's the fire department, EMTs, or um, the police department, there's someone there from, there's a potential for someone there from, uh, from Frontier to, uh, to be able to assist and to be able to, exactly as was stated, can we get them into better service so it doesn't have to come to the hospital? Can we get them into more appropriate service and people that are trained in that versus in our emergency room where we're just going to kind of cycle them through the way we, we do with all, all of the things that are coming at us? Um, so that's a great partnership and that's provided a lot of success. And then um, increased access to affordable housing. The homeless respite program actually came out of um, the city and the city, I sit on the city, uh, I don't know what you've renamed it now, but it's, it was a community housing and human services, RFP and evaluation committee. And from that years ago, there was an opportunity for the city to get a HUD grant on showing how homelessness, those that were experiencing homelessness are able to get into permanent housing from services and any of those services, whether it was the jail, whether it was social services, whether it was the hospital. And at that time, we didn't have a process, but it was kind of percolating and starting to talk about, like, what do we do with some of our homeless patients that come to us and really don't need to be there anymore, but they need some place to heal. They need some place to store medicine. You know, how are you supposed to address your diabetes if you don't have a refrigerator? Where are you going to put your insulin? Um, so we worked with Catholic Charities and established this um, homeless respite program. And at the beginning, the city actually paid for that because it was once they were done with the acute healing and the acute need, but maybe there was still a wait list for them to get in the housing, then they would go move, be moved into that bed so that we still had them, we still ha could have contact with them, we still had access to them um, before we could get them into permanent housing. Um, I believe the, the city had to cut that funding, but we continue to work on that. And the impetus around our respite program, it wasn't around the return on investment for us. It was around the um, appropriate care for this person. And by partnering with the agencies of Catholic Charities and, and Volunteers of America, they can use their uh, case managers to access behavioral health, substance abuse treatment, housing, primary care, any of those things that we, um, that are, what the person may view as, as their barrier to the next step, to how, if it's housing, if it, whatever that stability is for them, 
they can develop that relationship. And this was an avenue to help create that it, because yeah, when you're facing illness and you finally get a chance to take away that chronic stress of where am I going to eat next? Where am I going to live? You can start thinking about the next thing. What is that next thing that really is um, harming you um, and that you want to want to address? Then we can start getting people more stable. And we're in the process right now with Family Promises to develop a family respite program. Um, one of the worst things is we don't want families to um, – to be separated because of a medical issue and because they're experiencing homelessness. So is there, you know, a, a facility, a space that they could have that uh, roof, access to, to a kitchen, access to a bathroom and let their family member heal. Um, one of the most heart wrenching things was um, we had, uh, it was in our hospital. We had a, a young person who was facing cancer, needed to go through chemotherapy but they were homeless. And so CPS removed them from their home, put them in foster care because they didn't have that stable living environment. So not only did this youth have trauma from being homeless, trauma from cancer, now trauma from being separated from their family. So we want to make sure that that, that is not a reason for separating. And so we're working with family promises to, um, to create that. And I think, well, I think it's getting off the ground this year. Um, we've given them the funding and it's just a matter of kind of finding the communication between around what, what, what will be accepted, what are the guidelines, getting everyone onto those um, same kind of, uh, the same communication path. Um, so I think those are, those are just a few. Uh, we have many more, like I mentioned, there's about $3 million that we give out every year um, to address these issues. Um, so there's much more and always we have to include that in our needs assessment. Um, and so with that, I, I'll leave it for questions. Sarah, Council Member yeah. Wilkerson here. Thank, thank you. And um, as the newest council member, that was really good for me. I guess my challenge is in my short time is as a city, we've made some partnerships, but we operate in silos. So we continue to address our homeless, unhoused problems. Who should we be inviting from city council to the table to help be part of this conversation because I still feel we're missing some people at the table to help us solve some of these issues. Just within Providence or just in general? We'll start with y'all first, but in general. <laughs> well, I always like to include our social workers um, just because I really think that they, they are the first line for any of our patients, especially our low income or, or our um, homeless patients, um, really addressing that need. We are, um, we have some efforts around disparities and health equity disparities. And um, so as that grows and what that looks like, you know, bring in those community health workers, bring in those people that are be very focused in those populations would be good to get the, you know, to help bridge that voice within the community. Um, we've started actually in, in terms of housing and I think I'm excited to get that meeting on the calendar with you, that the uh, council member Wilkerson is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are partnering with Carl Massey Center because under um, prior to Spokane, there was some evidence shown around flexible spending. And so we are partnering with Carl Massey Center because there's a group that's working on, it's a black owned business that's working on um, uh, uplifting BIPOC community members into housing ownership. But a lot of times they have to rent in between. There's some things, a car goes out. You know, who, are you going to pay the few hundred dollars to be able to get your car fixed so you can go to work, so you can continue to work, so you can make that, and then you might have to miss a rent payment? Well, if we have this flexible spend, spending within Carl Maxi Center, we could help someone, give them that leg up to be able to do that. And so we're looking at some of those Agencies are the grassroots efforts that are really in with their communities to um, to look at addressing these issues because we can put housing up, we can put buildings up, but you really need to have that support system with them. And what does that community look like? What does that support look like for for these people? Which you know that, that may look different than my community or what I would presume. And I can't assume, I can't presume to think that what I would want would be the same as other people. Does that answer your question? So I'm saying get with the grassroots efforts. <laughs> yes. 
And, and I appreciate the investment of Providence into these smaller organizations to help them build capacity to do that work. I think that's critical not only from the hospital perspective, but as from the city also, as the things that we're looking at doing, we don't have to do it all, but how do we help stand up the organizations that are doing that work already? So yes, meetings coming. Yes, and that's one of the things that I like to kind of put out there is we are very blessed as a community that we have Providence funds to tap into because that's exactly what I look at is oftentimes there's restrictions around what the, the funding that comes through. And that's one reason I sit on that RFP committee is to know why are, are things getting denied or why are things. This is, then I can step in with, hey, I could help fill this gap until the city could come in or until we can get this additional funding. But I can, or I can fund this that isn't available through this funding that the federal government or the state government has said this could only go to X, Y, and Z. Then we can, we can work to help build the whole picture and not just some of these pieces. Council Member Stratton. I would just ask as, as conversations continue and when we get to the piece of um, the very important problem of homelessness that we're seeing everywhere. Um, I would hope that that conversation could include a sit down with the city because we're constantly trying to find solutions. We put a lot of band-aids out there, but we're not making any headway. It includes the city, the hospitals and higher ed, because I think those groups together could build a program an overarching program utilizing students, utilizing um, um, research. It would take money, but I think we're not going to solve that problem unless the big players get together around the table and discuss what strengths we have to bring to the table. And to me, it, that sits with healthcare, higher ed, and the city, and what we can build. Um, I, I think there's some really um, possibilities. There's some real possibilities there. So I would just hope if, if, if we start focusing on homeless, um, that those, those, I would love to be involved in that because it's something that I've thought about for a long time. Um, and I want the Jensen Bird Building just to throw that out there because could you imagine what we could do with the Jensen Bird Building? for a one-stop resource, everything for people there. But I do think we need to have those conversations because we're, we're, not, we're not making a difference until we really put our heads together and our resources together to see what we can do as a community to um, help those people living on the streets um, get safe and housed. I'm all in, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? All right. Thanks, Sarah, for spending some time with us. Uh, Melissa, who's next? Um, the last one we had was Helene Dewey from um, the Spokane Regional Department, the Health Equity All right. Specialist. Well, welcome, Helene. It's great to see you again. Nice to see everybody, and thank you um, for the invite. So Council President Beggs and City Council members, again, thank you. And for those of you, I think there might be a couple of folks that have not met. My name is Helene Dewey, and I am the Health Equity Specialist here at the Spokane Regional Health District. And can, oh, nobody could see my screen here. So I'm just going to go through um, really how we look at health equity uh, here at the Spokane Regional Health District and what we um, kind of the framework that we utilize and just kind of connect the dots hopefully for a few folks. Okay, can right. everybody see my screen there? We How's see it. Perfect. So um, I just wanted to get us on some common ground uh, just to start. Um, first, just I'm sure you guys have seen this slide, but really just wanting to reiterate the difference between equity versus um, equality. And I like bikes, there's that too. But really when we talk about equity, we just wanna make sure that, that folks are getting the services and the resources that they need that are specific to their, specific, their unique needs. 
And when we talk about what creates health, there are many factors. Um, and I think there's a lot of, um, this is where we have maybe sometimes misunderstanding about what creates health. And I think um, in society, there might be a, the, a very um, large value that it's a very individualistic thing, that if people just did the right behavior, they'll have the best health. And what we do know is that there are certain things that um, their socioeconomic factors, um, access to health care, their genetics, and their environment can also impact their health. And I want to um, lead this conversation in a way that we have been leading the conversations around health equity for the last several years. And we lead uh, the conversation with race. And when we look at the, the, all of the, our past community health needs assessment, we have disparities, and we have disparities by race. And with this, la this next um, community health needs assessment, we will disaggregate the data, and more than likely, unfortunately, we will, we will see those disparities. But what I want to reiterate that those racial disparities persist in every single system without exception. In every single system, in every single sector, we are calling it something different. We call it child welfare, or in child welfare, we call it disproportionality. In education, we call it the achievement gap. Um, in economic development, historically underutilized businesses, we are calling it something different, but it's in every single sector. And when we look at racism and how it creates and impacts health outcomes, um, you heard Kevin talk a little bit about um, allostatic load, uh, easily, more easily said, chronic stress or toxic stress. Um, but when we look at racism on the top, and we could add any ism, whether it's sexism, classism to this, it leads to different access to resources and living conditions, which can impact, it adds chronic stress. And that chronic stress has pretty specific biolog biological changes. There's new research around epigenetic changes. And that's when we have the altering of physical structure within our DNA, DNA methylation, when exposed to trauma or chronic stress. And then again, allostatic load, that, that chronic stress, that toxic stress that's always there um, when we face discrimination. And that ultimately leads to those health inequities, poor health outcomes, which some communities have disproportionate um, in, out, outcomes from. And, and in the vein of COVID, I just want to um, highlight, too, that what we saw with COVID is that some communities that had co certain co comorbidities also had higher risk for uh, severe illness or death from COVID. And this is a model that we've been using. We've adopted this from the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative. A lot of public health departments across the nation have. And this just really shows that kind of upstream, uh, downstream type model. And what we have here is that we show the very classic medical model where we have, we know that there are certain behaviors that can lead to certain uh, disease and injury states, which ultimately leads to a certain type of mortality. And what we used to do is in, health, in public health, we were like, well, we just want people to have the best behavior. So we educate them on how to be more physically active, on how to eat healthy, and what, or not to smoke, but we know, what we know now is that there are factors, um, certain living conditions that play into impacting those behaviors. And that's where we get into that socio-ecological model or it's kind of that upstream, if you will. And so what it says is that we have social inequities, our neighborhoods, um, residential segregation, our workplaces that are, are created and decisions are made within um, certain institutions um, whether they're uh, private, public, and those decisions sometimes are made um, with our beliefs, right, our biases, um, narratives that we have about certain folks or certain communities. And so this um, also just shows how, uh, what we can do to impact those. So ultimately, biased beliefs, those decisions, those, those narratives, those harmful narratives, can lead to policies and practices that create inequities, that, can, that create neglected communities, which impact our behavior, our disease state, and ultimately our death. And we need to be impacting every single level of the stream, right? We still need emergency rooms, we still need clinics, we still need to educate folks on, on healthy behaviors. But what we also need to do is start looking at how do we share power with communities? 
how do we get communities most impacted by inequities to the table? It's been said so many times this last year that the folks who are impacted the most are also closest to the solutions. And so how do we get folks to the table to better understand what those solutions are? And how do we ensure that our policies and partnerships are, are equity-based, that promote equity and are anti-racist? And again, how do we change those conversations? Again, the harmful co narratives that we hold about certain communities that in some cases can inform our decisions, um, sometimes explicitly, but also impl implicitly. And I wanted to uh, share this. I haven't shared this that much, but this really just shows what that, that upstream and downstream looks like in, in regards to COVID. What we saw nationally with COVID is that we had communities that were disproportionately impacted. So here in the downstream, we had certain racial and ethnic groups, African American, Latinx, Native American, Pacific Islander, folks who are um, undocumented, folks with limited English, English proficiency, people with living with disabilities and people experiencing homelessness. And when we start to go more upstream and to ask those why, well, they developed COVID. And why did they develop COVID? And so this is where we're really looking at, well, what are those behaviors? We put out public health guidance we wanted folks to maintain that six foot distance, avoid crowds, wear masks, wash hands, quarantine if exposed, test if you think you're exposed, isolate a positive, uh, and getting, get vaccinated ultimately. And what we're finding is that it's, it's very difficult for folks to follow th this. If there are systems and structures in place that make it difficult to do so. And that's where we get into the living conditions. And as elected officials and, and folks in other um, sectors, if we look at these living conditions and if we wanted to circle every single factor living condition that came into play with COVID, I think it's safe to say we can circle every one of these, right? Uh, transportation, housing, food insecurity, experiences of discrimination, employment, income, healthcare, education, et cetera, childcare. What we found when we were doing care coordination, case investigation, is that a lot of our staff was really focusing on getting folks to, to, to be able to follow public health guidance. If they needed to isolate, they were having to address issues with transportation, with food insecurity, housing, childcare, et cetera. We had public health staff really working in these living conditions to put the band-aids on, right? And ultimately the question is, how do we, how do we have to, how do we get to a point where we're stopping to put band-aids on these bleeds and really fix um, what those structures, what's creating the bleed? And then ultimately, if we ask the why, what well, we have in institutional inequities, we have policies and practices, procedures out there that might not be for everybody. And again, when we ask the next why, it's those inequities is again the harmful narratives that we've or assumptions that we have about communities and what communities need. Um, and thinking about what it looks like um, in practice in public health, um, Sarah had mentioned what our priorities were from, from the 2018 community health needs assessment, um, violence and abuse, mental health and housing. And this is an example, uh, example of that upstream downstream with uh, family violence and trauma. When we look at those, those isms, those harmful narratives that, um, that folks have, um, assumptions that folks have, when it comes to domestic violence even, there are harmful narratives about perpetrators or victims of violence. Um, program and policy focus is, is often on women and not men. It's really what stories do we tell us ourselves or others about people involved in sexual assault, child abuse, or domestic violence? And what are those, those systems? What are the, the policies that are in place that are making it really challenging for, for folks to access the services that they need to ultimately impact their health outcomes? And so it really is connecting the dots. Um, so what do non-discriminatory practices and policies look like? Societal changes in laws, conditions and systems that support health, 
And ultimately, how do we create safe and responsive environments through policies and systems change, develop a positive social network of families, and increase trauma-informed environments using the voice of clients? And I guess that, that looks like all I have. Um, and I actually did want to share um, very quickly. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here if I could figure out how to do so. Um, we often use a, um, a, a metaphor, if you will, on how to better understand what structural racism looks like and how it, it comes out to play. And so bear with me. I do have a link for this that I'll share in the chat. And this is what we call the groundwater analogy. And if you, so say you have, you are living lakefront and you go outside your house one day and there's a lake and you see one fish floating belly up. It does, does it make sense to anal analyze that fish or you're just like a fish died and that's really sad, right? Imagine the one fish is a st one student failing in the education system. We'd ask, did, it, did, did that student st study hard enough? Did they get the support that they needed at home? Those are the types of questions if, if one of those fish ended up dead or a student um, was failing the system. But if you come out of the same lake and half of the fish are floating belly up dead, what would, what's the question you're gonna start asking? What's in the water? Right? What's happening in the water to create that environment that half of those fish are belly up dead? Say the next day you go outside and you have several lakes around your home and you see in every single lake half of the fish are floating belly up dead. The question that we ask now is what's in the groundwater? What's in the groundwater that's feeding every one of those lakes that we're seeing the same disproportionate impact of fish. It's the same with structural racism. We have um, groundwater that's feeding every single, our, single one of our sectors, right? And it's really how do we start creating those narratives and empowering communities to be part of the conversations about what those solutions are and what those policies look like. The example I like to give in regards to COVID is in the beginning of June, 2020, half, of, actually more than half, about 65% of our COVID positive cases were within the Pacific Islander community. And if we would have just sat down and think we're really smart public health people and we know what we need to do, we would have continued to have those rates. And we realized, and the community, Pacific Islander community came to us and they were like, we need to do something. And so it was working with them to identify what is it exactly that we need to do we found out that language access was an issue. We found that they are COFA residents. They're, they have, there are certain policies that are put in place for even unemployment benefits. Normally they can't access federal benefits, but the unemployment benefit for COVID they could, and they didn't know how to navigate the system. So we had folks going to work ill because they couldn't, otherwise what would they do? So there's just so many things that I think solutions that we may not be aware of that having folks at the table is really important. And I think the opportunity here when we look at our next community health needs assessment and see those disparities in our health outcomes and start connecting the dots and asking those whys and inform, having those informed by the communities most impacted is really when we're gonna to start to see those solutions surface. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time. And we only have two minutes and I apologize. Uh, any questions for Helene? I, I just want to thank you, Helene, for that. So the challenge, I think, from council side is we hear so much community outcry. Well, if you would just put them um, in programs or treatment, that would be the solution to some of the challenges we face downtown. However, I have been sharing with general population that that just does not happen overnight and that that system itself is under a lot of stress uh, with its own capacity to meet the needs. And really, with the assessment, how our community could lean in to support expansions of those because city doesn't do treatment programs, but we can help support and help legislate to uh, improve capacity. Mm -hmm. 
All right, thanks for that, Councilmember Wilkerson. Any other questions or comments for this panel? All right, then I will let all you visitors go. Uh, you can stay. We, we do have another topic. I don't think we're going to be able to do it justice today, but I do at least want to introduce it so that people can be thinking about it. And that is um, Council Administration Strategic Planning. Um, several of us in Council suggested a year ago, um, maybe even over a year ago, that a great way to create some alignment between the new mayoral administration and City Council would be to undertake some type of strategic planning. And at least four of us on Council went through a strategic planning process uh, with the upper levels of the Condon administration. Um, almost, I'm looking around and thinking, almost no staff people uh, for council were part of that, and three council members weren't part of that. So I was just going to give a little bit of uh, my recollection of what our structure was, and then invite maybe some initial comments of what people either want to see or don't want to see, uh, because there is a kind of a little work group going with the administration on trying to figure out a process. Um, so my recollection of um, several years ago was that we had, there, were, there was a planning group, I'm sure, uh, originally, I was not part of that. I was a fairly new council member, but we had a, a, I don't know if it was a full day or three quarters of a day, pretty big meeting with uh, the mayor, the city administrator, and some of the top cabinet people, and then all of city council. We had a facilitator, Dr. Patrick Jones from EWU, and we just talked about uh, what the really high elevation goals might be for the city in various sectors of the work that we all do. Um, and we, we delved into both some specifics, but also just some guiding principles that we agreed on. And we came up with uh, a, quite a bit of common ground. And then the, there was a much smaller group, um, Council Member Waldruff and Rick Romero, I know were um, key to that, and they fleshed things out. And that's where we came up with our current uh, four committee structure. And then we had uh, goals really up to six years um, for each organized by committee and performance points. And we had dashboards and we had colors, green, yellow and red as far as progress um, and we designated a council member to chair each committee and then we had a designated senior administrative lead and they would work together on agendas uh, for council meetings and you can still see on our agendas kind of the vestiges of these um, areas that we're supposed to be focusing on that we rarely uh, we rarely put agenda items under those areas anymore uh, but they're still on our agendas. Um, and that's what happened for a while. I, I will submit my experience was that a lot of the work towards that strategic plan was focused on the last two years of the Condon administration. Um, and so the longer team things weren't really addressed as much and are kind of, I would say, floundering out there a little bit at this point. So that's... Um, but we did accomplish many things, and I would say, and I'll leave it up to other council members who participated, I thought it was a high-water mark in terms of collaboration and feeling of uh, being on the same page. Uh, so that was one reason I suggested to the new mayor that I think we should pursue that experience again. I'm sure it would be even better and more alignment and more collaboration. Um, but right now there is a small group, um, Eric Finch and... Um, Brian McClatchy and Lisa Gardner and I think Brian Coddington and maybe Brandy uh, Cody uh, are just kind of working a little bit on planning and they're looking for some direction from us um, as, as a council of what we want to see. And so I'm going to just throw it open to comments again of what people hope they would see more of or less of, something they feel strongly about one way or the other, just kind of from a high elevation that will give us some input. And then we'll schedule some more time together because we're a little bit over time. But I just wanted, because that planning group is meeting, and I want to get them some um, early, earlier feedback than later. So 
I'll throw it open for anyone. Councilmember Kinnear. Uh, thanks. Councilmember Stratton and I were together and met with Eric and Randy Cote, right? Was that it? Okay. It, it was not, it left, uh, it left me unfulfilled in terms of where we were going and the expectation. I think part of the problem is that the first time around, our strategic goals, how our committee structure happened was um, done, but outside of the council process. We ultimately approved it, but I always felt kind of, I felt kind of strong-armed to do it a certain way. I felt that our committees were oftentimes hijacked and we weren't really able to put on what we needed, but it was more the administration taking over our committees. Uh, that was then. And so fast forward, I'd like to get back to the, to the core of what we do. Those committees are council committees, and we need to put on our agenda what we want to talk about, what's important to us. And I don't feel that that is happening right now. I feel a lot of times it is still driven by administration. I, and I was struggling. I talked with Karen after, after we were done. And I, chime in, please, Karen, because I, I just didn't feel like we were getting anywhere. Eric uh, said several times, oh, this is, this is going to be help us with our budgeting. And I'm going, no. That's not what we should be doing this for. And so he was focused on budgeting. And I think, Karen, you and I were focused on how are we going to move forward with the strategic plan? And we just weren't getting anywhere. It was just it needs somebody like a Patrick Jones or Rick Romero or somebody outside of the administration to pull this together if it's going to work. It can't have an administrative person in there trying to make us all sing kumbaya, that it's just not going to work that way. So <clears throat> if we're going to pull this off, I think we need to bring in an outside person. I think we need to go back to the real um, crux of what we're trying to do as a council and that these are council committees and the why. Why are they council committees? And go from there. Or we just continue on the way we are and restructure our strategic goals, because a lot of those just don't matter anymore. They never got done. They weren't ours in the first place. And maybe we just move on and do something else. So I, I left that meeting feeling a little disheartened. That's so Karen, you're being quiet. No, I was going to say uh, you, you've explained that very well. I felt the same way. I, I'm going to be really honest. Um, I think sometimes we make things harder than they have to be. These are council committees. Um, it's up to us to determine the issues, what's coming up, what, what we want to talk about. Uh, we're doing it. We're, I mean, we always listen to staff. When staff comes up and they have something they want to talk about, we get those on our committees. But I just am frustrated because they're, it doesn't feel there are ours anymore. Uh, I'm okay with, with not always agreeing with people as long as we can agree professionally and with respect. I'm okay with that. And I, I, I think we're spending a lot of energy um, with this whole, Lori said kumbaya, but with this whole, you know, we want everybody to know we all get along. I just want to, I just want our committees to be ours. I mean, that's to sit around and rehash this and to spend the time that we did before, I I just, I don't have it in me. I mean, I, I just don't feel any ownership of what we're, what we're doing with these committees. And, I, and I'm sorry, that's kind of a big downer, but um, it's, I felt that way for a long time and I've tried to just kind of stay within what I feel comfortable with. And, um, but I, I just think they need to be ours, and it's great that we're working together with the administration. It doesn't mean anything that we want to pull back a little bit, but if we're going to change something, do it soon because we got to we got to keep moving. 
All right. Thanks. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I, I guess I don't really have the history um, with regard to the committees, but I would agree. I mean, there are committees, there are committees. I don't see why or how there should be interference. Um, certainly, if there's a good idea from anybody, uh, regardless of what side of the seventh floor they're on. But um, to me, the bigger, a, a big, not bigger, but a big issue, it's just a frustration of mine, it'd be great to find some, some way forward on is a lot of times when we are taking up various issues, the facts that are shared with me from each side of the seventh floor differ. And it would be great if we find a way to all be on the same page with regard to what the facts on the ground are. Uh, we can have different outcomes. We can have different directions we want to go based on those facts. But, but it'd be great to have to and not exactly sure the best way to try and achieve that. But I think if we could find a mechanism to do that, it'd be certainly helpful for me. Yeah, that's a good point. Councilmember Mum. Hi. Um, I'm all for taking a fresh look at a strategic plan, but I, I'm also backing up Councilmember Kinnear and um, Councilmember Stratton in that the, these are definitely our committees and we need to design them. And I really don't need people to read PowerPoint presentations to me all day long. I would love to have a discussion with my own council members about things that we really need to make decisions on. There's so few meetings we have where we can all seven be in the room at the same time. And I just encourage all of us to have, make space for those dialogues in our meetings and uh, maybe put more things on consent agendas. <laughs> and so we can have those good conversations, especially with COVID. We're not in the office where we can bump into each other and have conversations like we used to. So um, that, that would be my wish overall. But I do want to bring up um, the, the whole um, refresh of a strategic plan or, or kind of starting from scratch. I want to encourage us to say we don't need to start from scratch. We have spent tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on some fantastic plans that haven't been implemented. Let's start with a comprehensive plan, the water plan. The sewer plan, we have all these plans. That's what I think we should be talking about, how to get those done, because that's going to build our city. That's going to get what the citizens have been asking for. The citizens have engaged on these things. So I'm willing to participate in strategic plans, but let's bring those plans forward and meet with staff and say, we all decided on this a long time ago. Let's get it done. And I think COVID put a pause on it, but I, I don't think it has to be a huge lift, kind of what you were saying, Councilmember Stratton, don't make it so hard. Let's look at what we said we were going to do. Let's talk about what's happening at Spokane Transit. I mean, my Lord, the money that's coming forward on that and the game changer for our community and, and building up those communities around those, those transit stops, we're not ready for that yet. What about the North-South Corridor and those off-ramps? Those communities are going to get hit hard with pressure. We're not ready for it. So I had a conversation with Johnny Perkins about that. I think identifying those things and getting ready to roll, I'd love to get to work on that. And Yes, we have other social issues, homelessness, that sort of thing. But I feel like the whole development of the city has kind of been put on pause, and it's up to us to unwrap those plans and put them together in a, in a timeline to unfold them. So that's kind of where I'm sitting. Yeah, I just wanted to editorialize one thing. I was just thinking about committees as what anyone presenting, whether it's a council member presenting or staff, I would really like folks – to bring questions that they want to ask council members that, that instead of just presenting and then that it's like, no, what's the question that you need to move forward from that? So I'm, I'm just editorializing for all of us to, to come up with the presentation and then what are the questions that will move us forward? So I'm just throwing that out there, but other comments, thoughts. I hope we didn't rain on your parade, Council President. No, I'm all about the feedback. So I will gather it and uh, bring it uh, to the small planning group because this only works if everyone uh, feels like it's going to be valuable. And um, so, no, much rather hear it now than at the first 15 minutes of the joint meeting. <laughs> so, that's good. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's all I have for today. Anything? Thing from anyone else for the good of the order? Councilmember Mum. It was a great meeting. Oh, good. It was a great meeting. Uh, more of these, please. 
uh, I, I got to say, I'm wanting to cheerlead Spokane to get their vaccinations. Mm. And I, I love getting the reports about how things are going. I want to hear about what we're doing mm -hmm. and how we're getting more shots in people's arms. And we just this week at Spokane Transit heard that STA wants our fire department to see if they can help stand up a pop-up clinic for their, not just their employees, but maybe their families as well. If we can do it for hopefully STA, let's do it for our workers. Let's do it for other places. I would love to see more leadership. I don't know how to get there. If you guys have ideas, we've got to take the lead on this. King County is kicking our behind if you've looked at the numbers of their percentage of people being inoculated, there's no reason why we, Spokane County can't be where King County is. Let's get there. Let's, let's, you know, we complain about going back to phase two. How many front page news are, ooh, we're going to phase two. Well, what are we doing to keep us from going to phase two? And um, I think we all should be talking about this. So yep. if there's Can something new. Mom? Yes. I want you to know that we were finally able to make our appointments to get our COVID shots, my husband and I. It took literally one minute to find a place, sign up, and be done, and our first one's tomorrow. It was like not a big deal to sign up. And I had someone, a service, a plumber at my house who just, you know, he, he came in with a mask and we talked about it. I said, have you gotten your shot? And he goes, well, I, I don't know how. I'm like, oh, my goodness, people. So I don't know if we want to look at putting some dollars toward public relations, if we can talk with the mayor's side about getting more information out. I know we think we put tons out, but I, most of the stuff I see is reporting of the state, the state of the health situation. I want to know where plugging people in and being that communicator. It's a lot of people like, you know, don't know that it just takes one minute. There, I will say um, from listening in on the, every other Tuesday meeting with the health district. They, they do have a pretty elaborate new uh, promotional plan going out, both social media and um, traditional advertising that's really focused at the generation that's not getting vaccinated. So they, there are things going on. I'm not saying we should do anything less and not do more, but I just want you to know that there are, there are efforts and they're targeted towards the people who aren't getting the vaccine. I know I'm beating this drum hard, but if we can put something about conserving water in your utility bills, why can't we put something about how to get your COVID shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, let's Great think point. at every level. Yep. Yep. No, I, I, I tried to be clear. I, I'm not saying that to say that we should rest at all. I just wanted to so that there is some, there are some things going on that we might, I wouldn't have known, but going to that call. So I'm but, glad, I'm glad to hear that couple yep. president. And, and I think if we can, take what they're doing and port it over to yep. our channels of distribution, social media, website. Yep. When you answer the phone at 311, we could offer that services. Yep. Would you need help setting up your COVID shot? I mean, yep. I, this is a public yep. health emergency mm -hmm. yep. and we can take the lead on this. Nope. I a hundred percent agree. If you go to Dave's pizza, you get a, a slice of pizza and your shot. So if anybody needs a shot today, go to David's, get a piece of pizza, and have a shot. Yep. See, this guy's got it figured out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they are starting, uh, going to have some happy hours at the arena, but alcohol-free. So they're just going to be food and party and music. So they, 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 it's coming. But I so agree with you that we should use every channel because that's the only thing that we can do to not go back to phase two. So that's, we need to, so. Okay, anything else from anyone? All right. Well, have a great day. Great rest of the week. We'll see everyone back Monday for 115. Must be Urban Experience, Council Member Stratton. So, we'll see you then. Take care. We're adjourned. Bye.